My name is uh, Dr. Kartike Numapati. I am from UNF. I am one of the co-directors for this program. And uh, I want to welcome you for coming down to the Florida Data Science Big Reveal event. So we're going to get started with introducing the other team members. Dr. Dan Richard is the other uh, program co-director. He is from uh, Psychology uh, Department from UNF. The other important team members are the, uh, our advisory board member, uh, Jennifer from Fidelity, Ari from Jaguars, Ari, please wave the end for everyone. And R Robert Marsh, Robert is not here, but uh, uh, Robbie from NLP Logics are there. So the advisory board members, they help us in guiding the whole event and making sure that uh, we are following the industry practices and doing the level best we can to achieve our, our uh, program objectives. And we also get a lot of help from other faculties in UNF and other uh, industry members. Uh, we have Jay Lewis from Everbank. Jay, please wave your hand. And uh, uh, Kellen from Jaguars. So they help us to ensure that we are using best practices, industry best practices, as we come up with solutions for the problems we are solving. And uh, we have other faculty fellows, Emma, Dr. Emma Aptu from Public Health, Dr. Sandeep Rediwari, and uh, Dr. Bogdan Vishnu from Statistics. Uh, Emma uh, and Sandeep are not here. And the most important players for our program are our uh, intern. Uh, Yvonne is Master of Science Psychology student. Rachel, she's also Master of Science Psychology student. And uh, in all, uh, uh, information science undergraduate uh, in School of Computing. And uh, Greg, Master of Science Psychology student. And uh, Jason, Computer Science undergraduate student. So th they are the key players. Now you guys will be all wondering what exactly is data science for social good. So uh, just of the program is, we are interested in uh, developing the uh, talent pool of data scientists in our area. So for that, we go after students who are aspiring to be a data scientist. And we kind of create a paid summer internship. And we are using this internship to train them data science skill sets. In order to train them, we need real world projects. For that, we reach out to the local nonprofits and we ask for the wicked problems they have for which data science techniques has to be used to solve those problems. And that's essentially what makes it data science for social good. We are using data science skill set to solve social good problems. Right? This concept was started from University of Chicago in the Policy Center. They've been doing it for the past four years. So we got the wind of it last year. And we start, Dan and I started talking about it, planning about it, and we are, we are uh, testing that idea, piloting that today. And we hope to continue to do it uh, for the forthcoming years. Right. So uh, the other components within the Florida Data Science for Social Good are the funders. Uh, nonprofit Center was uh, uh, helping us fund it. They graciously support us with the program. So they funded the SEED program, and we will be looking for uh, other funders to sustain the program. And most important component of our clients who are the nonprofit organizations. And the other important team players you guys already saw who are the students and the uh, program team members. So with that, I'd like to pass on the baton to Dr. Dan Richard, who's going to go more, go you, give you a more overview about the 2017 program. Thank you. So a bit about uh, data science. What is the process that we go through when we have uh, one of these projects? How, do, how does our mind work? How do we think about it? Uh, first of all, we work with uh, nonprofit organizations who are dealing with a wicked problem. And uh, what do we mean by a wicked problem? A wicked problem is one that cannot be solved by one organization or one individual alone. So it takes collaboration and cooperation from multiple organizations dealing with that problem to see a resolution. It also tends to have policy implications um, that uh, individuals need to implement uh, once those solutions are identified. So we uh, have uh, 
done that, worked with different nonprofit organizations. And then there's a stage where you gather information and you formulate a plan about how you're going to deal with that information, how you're going to uh, analyze that information. That planning stage is really important uh, to work with the community partners and figure out what are the best avenues, what are the important questions, and what are the important variables um, that we need to look at as we work through this problem. At this stage, we also have to consider the infrastructure, um, the commitment that the organization has in dealing with this uh, problem from a data-driven approach. So uh, we, we get that information from the nonprofit organizations. We do lots of math and data visualizations, and we try to discover some hidden patterns in the data as uh, it's revealed to us. And the goal, the ultimate goal, is to give this information back to the nonprofit organizations so that they can make good decisions, data-driven decisions in their own organizations and to help address these wicked problems in the future. So uh, that's what we hope to show you uh, this evening through uh, three project presentations. So to give you a sense of when all this started, as uh, Karthik mentioned, about uh, over a year ago, we started having conversations, but uh, all of that um, uh, ended up in a call for proposals that came out in January of this year. So uh, we uh, contacted the nonprofit organizations and, and let them know a little bit about what we were trying to do and asked them to submit a proposal. We also did a, a webinar to help inform those about what we were looking for, what were the specifics of the program that were necessary to be a part of the project. And then after that, uh, we received those project proposals. We had interviews with all of the potential partners, community partners, asked them information about their infrastructure, their readiness, uh, what types of data they had, and to, to determine if the data was suitable for this type of project. In some instances, um, we were able to make that determination. So after we get uh, agreements with those community partners, then we recruit students that match, that have skills that can uh, bear on the specific projects that the community partners are looking to, um, to initiate. And so that's, um, that happened in uh, April, and we've, the students have been working over the summer, this whole summer, on these projects, and the presentations we're gonna show you tonight are a result of all of that um, effort. So we have three uh, presentations prepared for you, uh, Changing Homelessness, Yoga for Change and Mayo Clinic Wellness Rx. And at this time, I'd like to invite Rachel uh, and, oh, I'm sorry. This time, I'd like to invite Rena um, to the stage for some uh, reflections from our funder. Yeah. Thank you, Rena. Sure. Hi, I'm, you know, can't pass up an opportunity to grab a microphone. Um, my name's Rena Coughlin. I'm the CEO of the Nonprofit Center, and welcome to the Jesse Ball DuPont Center. Um, I don't know how many of you been here, have been here before, but um, it's a terrific place for the community to gather. And it's a great place for us to reveal what's happening in the Florida Data Science for Social Good project our first year. Because I think the uh, Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and the nonprofits that are lucky enough to live here and work here, we have access to great technology and we work together daily on collective problem solving. And I think it's a great model for the rest of the sector that the rest of the sector is anxious to learn more about. And I think that's one of the reasons we have a great turnout here today. I was teasing Karthik and Dan. I'm like, well, we just need a little boardroom or something. This is a you know, data reveal. And uh, they're like, no, I think this is going to be big. So I'm so happy to see all of you all here. And it is big. Some of the things that we're going to hear today are way beyond what I ever thought about when we first started thinking about the Data Science for Social Good project. And Karthik and Dan talked about sort of from the academic side, how they thought about this project and how they wanted to make sure that UNF students had an opportunity to interact with the community and learn firsthand about social impact um, solutions. Well. On the other side of the world, at the Nonprofit Center, we were getting ready to host uh, our first data and technology conference. And we had as our keynote speaker the gentleman who founded much of the work at the um, 
University of Chicago around data science, Andrew Means. And he was incredibly inspiring about the importance and the impact that applying data science, analytics, and uh, visualization to the nonprofit sector's challenges, how important that, probably more important than anything else that's happening in our world right now as nonprofits. I had a conversation the other day with a national leader of board training, and he knows all about you know, executive transitions and board challenges and this and that. And I, so I, I asked him, I said, what's your number one challenge for the future of the nonprofits? And I thought he'd say something related to his work. And he said, it's data. It is data. Nonprofits have to participate in, control, and set the agenda for how data is used to determine the, um, the work ahead for us. So with that, I just want to say again, thank you very much for coming out to hear this very exciting announcement for us. The Nonprofit Center was lucky enough, our, my board of directors, or the Nonprofit Center board of directors, many are here today. When we talked about the Data Science for Social Good project, they unanimously endorsed the Nonprofit Center being the seed project funder. We've never done anything like that before. We're like trying to get money. So to give it was a big deal for us. It really was. And so we're um, anxious to see how important this project is and how it affects so many people, because we need to tell that story and keep this project going. So with that, I'm going to let Rachel tell the very first story. Rachel, come on up. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> All right, so I would like to start this presentation with a statement regarding dignity and hope. For those that are facing homelessness, they may not feel very hopeful. They may be facing a chronic health condition, a mental health condition, worried about where their next food source is going to come from, or other social factors that we may not know about. That said, coming into this building tonight, we may have, we may have crossed paths with somebody that was considered to be homeless. We may have made assumptions. That's okay. We all do that. But what's even more important is the fact that if we don't know what's going on, they will continually just be considered as homeless. We lose sight of them as people. We need to know exactly who they are. That said, we partnered with Changing Homelessness to attack their wicked problem, asking us, are we ready for zero? That being functional or effective zero. Functional or effective zero basically tries to demonstrate that a community houses more individuals than they identify. So that said, a homeless individual comes into a homeless shelter, they are assessed and evaluated, their information is inputted, and instead of just going back into the streets, they are placed into permanent or temporary housing. This does one of two things. This helps us reach effective zero by moving people from a shelter into permanent, and permanent supportive housing, but also it gets people off the streets. But you're probably wondering, how are we going to do this? This sounds very complicated. Well, we need to understand who these people are. Who did we see when we walked by tonight? We need to understand the profiles. In doing so, we need data. Well, we have data. And so we have the Soulsbacher Center, City Rescue Mission, and the Salvation Army. We had three, these three shelters contributed for our data. Um, so a client comes in to these three shelters and it is input into the homeless management information systems. The HMIS asks questions ranging from their residence prior to entry, how long they have been homeless for, if they have any type of barriers, developmental, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, anything like that. We had 629 individuals that came from this system that was collected from March through June 2017. In addition, we also had richer data from these 629 individuals that came from the VI SPDAT. The VI SPDAT is a vulnerability index that taps into social and health factors. So with this data, we wanted to create data-driven profiles to understand who are we dealing with, who needs the most help. 
So like I said earlier, the people that we may have passed, these are different people with different problems. John and Sarah here, John is facing a chronic health condition that he's had for the last 20 years. It makes it very difficult for him to walk, to access medical services. Sarah, on the other hand, has been facing a mental health condition that leaves her with a drug dependency. These are two very different people, leading us to believe this is not a group level problem. This is an individual level problem. But before we move on with the profiles, we need a frame of reference. What exactly is happening in the United States as a nation? Well, as you can see, New York City and Los Angeles has very high prevalencies of homelessness, when in fact, Jacksonville is actually not that bad, especially to Fort Lauderdale. But what's even more important, and maybe even more surprising, is the costs. It costs about $31,000 in tax dollars to take care of homeless individuals. You may be wondering, that sounds like a lot for somebody that doesn't have a home, doesn't have an address. Well, it costs more money to take care of these people when they don't have an address. They're using more ambulatory services, emergency services, medical services, when in actuality, it would only cost six dollars to $12,000 to give them permanent supportive housing. This is savings of up to $49 million per year, not in the United States, in Jacksonville. Drilling down more specifically into Jacksonville, this is the point in time count of homelessness here within our city. As we can see, these are profiles that have already been created. These are the most common types of homeless individuals. As we can see in color here, this is our main focus. Chronically homeless in the spectrum, uh, these are the most vulnerable populations. These are the people that immediately need to be housed. Without that, the consequences can be devastating. To be considered chronically homeless, you have to have a disabling condition, something that is pervasive and consistent, something that causes serious impairment. Um, and you also have to be chronically homeless for a year or longer. And as we can see, the rates have gone down, but we have not reached effective zero and we have not eradicated homelessness. We are also very interested in this all other homeless. Who are these people? Why do we still have such a high rate? But it's also very important in understanding these profiles, a day in the life. We need to look at this from a more humanistic perspective. What are they spending their days doing? Where are they going in the day to find resources, to find food? So this is a day in the life for the migratory search for food. So perhaps they start at Hemming Park, go to Trinity Rescue Mission, go to Clara White for breakfast, Soulsbacher Center for lunch, the City Rescue Mission, or the Soulsbacher Center for dinner. This is a total of 3.37 miles for an average healthy person. John and Sarah are both facing chronic health conditions. Can you imagine how hard this would be for them? This is also a total of one hour and nine minutes. So this, is, this obviously is showing that this takes a long time for somebody to access these services. But you're probably more interested, what did we do with the data? What profiles did we find? Well, Greg is here to explain. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> Uh, so the first analysis that we conducted was on those individuals who had data from both the VI SPADAT and the HMIS data set. Uh, so what we found is that people typically differ across two dimensions, social and health vulnerability. So in the social vulnerability dimension, uh, you have things like whether their current period of homelessness was caused by trauma, uh, abuse, or poor social relationships, things like that. And then in the health vulnerability, you have uh, chronic health conditions, uh, whether they're not taking medications that they're supposed to, uh, things of that nature. So as you can see, we have three different clusters. So in the red, we have 56 individuals who are classified as most vulnerable. So those are people who are high on both the social and health vulnerability scales. In the yellow up there, we have 46 individuals who are classified with health concern. Uh, so they are high on the health vulnerability index, but low on the social vulnerability index. And then in the green here, we have 41 individuals who are situational. Uh, so they're low on both the social and health indexes. So of uh, importance to us, as well as changing homelessness and the shelters that administer these assessments, is what are the questions that best uh, place people into these groups? Which ones uh, determine which people go into uh, which classification. So as you can see, the HMIS, um, of the five questions that were deemed most important, 
The HMIS has only one question on it. So the other four are from the VI SPADAT. And as Rachel mentioned, not everyone who goes into these shelters is administered the VI SPADAT. So this means we could be missing a whole swath of vulnerable people simply because we're not asking the right questions. So to extend this, um, we tried to take what we learned from the VI SPADAT clusters and extend it to the people who had purely HMIS data. And so in doing this, we classified an additional 214 individuals. Uh, and as you can see, 76 of those were classified into the most vulnerable category. Uh, so these were people who would have been missed um, otherwise. And in talking with Lauren and other members of Changing Homelessness, uh, we found that dignity uh, was something that is not typically considered in homelessness research. Uh, so the number of meals provided, number of beds provided are, of course, important metrics. Uh, but we felt like dignity was an intangible thing that was still very important for people's well-being. And so we conducted an analysis and found that 10 questions fell into four categories uh, that explained dignity. So the four categories are respect, control, safety, and meaningful daily activity. So respect includes social relationships, uh, whether people owe money to others. Uh, control includes whether people can meet their basic daily needs on a regular basis. And safety includes whether people have been threatened, uh, engage in risky behavior, things like that. And then the meaningful daily activity is whether people uh, do things on a day-to-day -day basis that have intrinsic value to them. And so we also wanted to determine whether this dignity index uh, that we discovered uh, differentiated between the three clusters that we had. And so we did find that, in fact, it did, that those who were most vulnerable uh, also displayed the lowest amount of dignity compared to the situational and health concern. And so the two factors that played uh, the largest part in this were respect and control. Uh, so this dignity index is a novel way to conceptualize the issues that are facing homeless individuals. Uh, so if we ask the right questions, we can identify those uh, in dire need of assistance. Thank you very much. So, in conclusion, we come at you with some recommendations. We think that the HMIS is already doing a wonderful job and really tapping into these vulnerable populations, but we strongly believe that there are things that have been missed. The worst case scenario is that John and Sarah come into a homeless shelter, they are given the HMIS, and they are put into the wrong system or the wrong population. We don't want that to happen. We want more of a triage approach to happen. We want them to come in, we want them to be initially questioned, and we want more effective placement to be had. In doing so, we believe that we will understand all of these profiles, reach effective zero, and provide hope, support, and dignity for John and Sarah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I now would like to invite Hanal for Yoga for Change. So for this project, we have uh, analyzed the uh, impact of yoga curriculum on stress and mood level. So why particularly yoga? Most recent studies have, uh, on practice of yoga has been showing a positive effect on person's subtle changes in breathing, in breathing, heart rate, and, heart rate and uh, uh, feelings in the body. So uh, working towards these changes could help individual uh, get their uh, work on their uh, stress and traumas uh, so they can help. Uh, and therefore, the Yoga for Change has created a purpose-driven yoga curriculum to work on individual's physical and emotional uh, needs of each population that they serve. They go to different facilities to teach yoga to different uh, to work on to help them overcome the traumas. The uh, four different populations that they're focusing on are incarcerated, substance abuse, veterans, and vulnerable youth. So, for example, a John, uh, one of the students named John, um, he t he took a five session with VA Move. Um, 
from last year, uh, starting from January, uh, July to this year, January, um, in, in the beginning of, uh, for the veterans, and in the beginning of his session, he had a really, he comes with a really high stress and negative mood, but over the time, he, we see huge difference uh, in his stress level being zero and his mood level being 10 uh, at the best mood. Um, so we see through this prog uh, purpose-driven uh, yoga program, we see huge uh, if, uh, impact on person's individual, uh, individually emotional and physical health. So let's see their wicked problem. The uh, first wicked problem is to analyze the effect of the yoga. So over time, see the decrease in stress level and increase in mood level, as well as improvement in their uh, physical health, measuring the blood pressure and the heart rate. Another uh, wicked problem that we see that they gathered all the data on their no cards. So all the mood and stress level is self-reported, and also the heart rate uh, and blood pressure level is through the machine. So we help them out to create a better and organizing, a better organizer uh, way to collect the data for the uh, future. So the uh, sample data, data that we received was 1,745 records. Uh, we had three different data availables, personal, subjective, and objective. Under the personal, we had gender, population, and the uh, uh, time of the session. Majority were a male and uh, under the incarcerated population, and well, majority of the individuals have taken class uh, in the afternoon than the morning. Under the subjective, we see mood level, stress level, and under the uh, objective, we see uh, blood pressure level and heart rate. So we performed four types of analysis on this uh, data. Group level analysis to see uh, by, uh, by the gender, by population, and by the time of the session they, they take the class, see how overall how, they, how they're improving stress and the mood wise. Individual level, focusing on just one person and see, uh, because there, there are many students who take more than one session, to see their first initial session and the last session and how they grow uh, improving uh, stress-wise and the mood-wise. Longitudinal level, uh, help us analyze the, the over time change in overall, uh, like all the indiv uh, group level uh, uh, individually. And the clustering help us to analyze the pattern of pre-stress pre, uh, level uh, uh, mood level and the post-stress uh, level mood level. So here we see uh, stress before and after uh, by the gender. So we see uh, down, uh, it's decreasing uh, before and after the class. And here we see the mood. Uh, so it's, it's increasing for all the genders uh, after the class. So we, here we see the systolic blood pressure. So it's, uh, once the individual come in, they, they are with a higher blood pressure. But uh, as, as they take this more session, they go closer to the ideal blood pressure. Here we have a diastolic blood pressure. So we see the same pattern. They come with a little bit higher, and they go close to their ideal blood pressure. On the top, we have stress before and after uh, by the population, and we see decrease in the stress uh, uh, level all across the population. And on the bottom, we see mood before and after, uh, and we see increase in all across the uh, population. Group level an uh, analysis had uh, records uh, by the uh, record time as well. So uh, we, uh, like I said, the afternoon uh, were higher individual. Uh, so the stress uh, level was decreasing um, and the mood level was increasing um, in the morning and afternoon session both. Here we have individual levels. So the per, uh, student named uh, Jim, he had taken 21 session and uh, we see mood change. So the higher the bar graph is higher, his ch mood is getting better, uh, and getting a positive mood after the session. And on the bottom, we see stress change after the yoga. So, uh, and we see the dimension is negative. So it's, it's getting, um, um, neg uh, it's getting too closer to the zero um, after the session, the stress level. 
And next is longitudinal level. So now Greg will uh, continue from here. All right, so uh, we also wanted to look at, in addition to individual level, which and all explained with Jim, uh, we also wanted to look at how the people who took multiple sessions uh, varied across those sessions. So we have people who took one session all the way up to 10 or more sessions. Uh, and this graph shows their stress change across those sessions. So you can see the negative linear trend. Uh, that indicates that as people take more sessions, uh, their change in stress becomes more dramatic. So the effect of yoga is increasing over time on their stress levels. And this is mood, so you can see the same pattern, but in the opposite direction. So their mood is increasing over time. So the more sessions they take, the better their mood for these individuals. And in addition to the subjective measures, we also wanted to utilize the objective measure measures that Catherine and Yoga for Change had the foresight to include. Uh, so this is the blood pressure measure. And as you can see, we have three groups. Uh, the red are those who have hypertension stage two. Uh, so those are people with extremely high blood pressure. They would likely need to be on medication for it. Uh, in the yellow there, we have hypertension stage one. And in the, in the green, we have those with ideal blood pressure. So keep in mind, this is before yoga. Now after yoga, we have no one in hypertension stage two. So everyone has either shifted to stage one hypertension or into ideal blood pressure. And to make this more dramatic for you, uh, so we have 29 individuals in hypertension stage two, 100 in stage one, and 55 with ideal blood pressure before yoga. And now after, what happens is those with hypertension stage one uh, go to the ideal blood pressure group, and it doubles. So the number of people who have ideal blood pressure doubles after yoga. And then in addition, um, the people from hypertension stage two, they move into hypertension stage one. So we had a total of 29 people in stage two. So actually 23 of them went back into stage one hypertension, but amazingly six went from stage two hypertension to ideal blood pressure. Uh, so this, the <laughs> so the uh, objective measures along with the subjective measures of uh, mood and stress, uh, it really shows that yoga is helping uh, these four populations uh, in their um, in outcomes. So as we see, all the analysis results have been helpful to uh, each individual. And taking this uh, yoga sessions are uh, creating a positive change with the trauma, as well as improving their physical health in uh, terms of their blood pressure and heart rate. So improve, also uh, one of the wicked problems was the improving their data entry. So we have created a data entry form uh, for her to, uh, for Catherine to use uh, for future uh, data entry purposes. And adding uh, onto the future, ref uh, for future uh, references, uh, adding out uh, downstream outcomes would be also great to see how it's impacting the pers uh, uh, individual's person life, such as, um, recidivism and substance uh, abuse. And with that, uh, thank you. And I would like to invite uh, Yvonne for the uh, Mia Clinic project. Hello, everybody. If it's too poppy on the microphone, I can always just flip this up and filter <laughs> the sound out for you. Get the joke out of the way, loosen you guys up. All right, so I'm going to be talking about what we did uh, with Mayo Clinic and Wellness RX. Um, so uh, first, I'm going to start pretty broad, talking about uh, what Jacksonville at a whole has been doing. Um, so these six hospitals in Jacksonville have created uh, community health needs assessments every three years. And essentially what these are um, is an analysis of the uh, health problems around Jacksonville at the health zone level. So just to... Uh, show you what the health zones look like. This is the level of granularity that uh, is used right now to identify areas of need. Health zone one, um, right there in orange, being the, uh, the most need. Uh, so we decided to take the project and make it a little more granular, um, kind of taking Mayo's lead here. Uh, so just to go into uh, what Mayo's been doing um, on the census track level so far, 
uh, is they've been looking at this area that we've titled College Gardens. Is this census tract right in there in Hellstone 1? Um, and further, uh, Mayo Clinic has been uh, working in Newtown with their Wellness RX program, uh, working in the Newtown Success Zone, uh, kind of employing the resources they have already there. Uh, so the wicked problem uh, for Wellness RX that they're trying to solve right now, they're, they're, you know, their motto here is community drive and community change. So uh, where do they go next? Um, how do they make that decision? So uh, that's our goal with this pro uh, project. Uh, so we know that Jacksonville uh, has higher rates of uh, diabetes and stroke. Um, we're evened out with the national average with heart disease. Um, but these are uh, pretty high values, especially since Mayo Clinic is interested in uh, these three health outcomes, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. So when you see the national averages in comparison, you see that Jacksonville is higher. We know there's a need. We just can't identify exactly where. We can see Health Zone 1, but where in Health Zone 1 are these areas? So to solve uh, Mayo's wicked problem, uh, we started pretty broadly in the outer layer looking at uh, these community assets. So are there service providers in the community already? Um, an example would be the Newtown Success Zone uh, in the Newtown neighborhood. Uh, then we went to demographic factors. So uh, what's the makeup of the area? Uh, who's living in the population? Um, environmental factors would be things like uh, access to resources, so grocery stores, parks, clinics, things like that. Um, and then the negative health outcomes themselves. So uh, what, are the health come, uh, out, what are the health outcomes that we're seeing within these communities? And how are these other factors facilitating those negative health outcomes? So we. Uh, did some work with the data, and we identified two overall trends in the data. Uh, we labeled this first one long-term health outcomes. So these are things that would uh, be perpetuating um, over a long period of time. Uh, so heart disease, stroke, and poor mental health, as well as uh, poor dental. So that we noted poor dental by no dental visit within the past year. Um, so all of these things are going to be uh, health outcomes that you see build over a long period of time, whereas this uh, second factor, our daily determinant factor, is more of the day-to-day -day factors that someone has to deal with in, within a population. So uh, we look at obesity, so are they able to go out um, and access resources? Are there grocery stores in the area? Are there parks where they can go and get leisure activity? Uh, so for our methodology, we use the 500 Cities Project. I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, then we want to identify health outcomes uh, that not only interested in Mayo, but interested the uh, Jacksonville community at large. Um, and then we used a mapping that we're going to show a little bit later. It's really cool. So for our data source, uh, we used a few different sources. Uh, the Fiber to Cities project is the biggest one. It is the uh, first of its kind to look at health outcomes at the census tract level. Uh, which is really convenient for us. Uh, we use Google Developer to do some of the mapping, um, the property appraiser's office, Zillow to give us some of the titles. Not super interesting information, so I had to put it on a super interesting slide. So uh, thank you for paying attention. <laughs> um, so for the 500 Cities Project, um, essentially what it gives you is a percentage of a particular negative health outcome within a census tract. So the uh, neon yellow individuals represent uh, the people with the negative health outcome, we'll say stroke. Um, and then they're added into the total population. So it's just a raw percentage of who in the community has a specific health outcome. So we created, uh, we call them composites, um, but essentially what they are is targeting negative health outcomes. Uh, so Mayo interested in stroke, diabetes, and coronary heart disease. Um, but for community health needs assessment, uh, when we looked at those a little further, we did find that uh, they added three additional health outcomes, being obesity, mental health, and dental health. Uh, so we created two separate composite scores, one that's more targeted towards our partner and one that's more targeted to the community at large. So uh, with that, I will now uh, invite Jason up here to talk about the mapping that we use. All right, so imagine you are a decision maker for Mayo and you are tasked with identifying candidate neighborhoods for a health program such as Wellness RX. Well, with over 150 different neighborhoods within the city of Jacksonville, going one by one and looking at those neighborhoods as a whole is just not feasible. So in order to address this, we work together with the Mayo Clinic and have built two different dashboards, uh, a comparison dashboard that is used to uh, narrow down and identify several candidate neighborhoods, as well as a composite dashboard that is used to get a snapshot or a general idea of a, a given neighborhood or census tract. 
So right off, oops, you have everything. Okay. Sorry about that. So right off the bat, you can see a uh, shade map there in the uh, top left, and it just right now shows a uh, measures of um, the composite scores that Mayo is interested in across the city of Jacksonville. And thanks to the data from the 500 City Project, we are actually able to drill down to the census tract level and identify a few different neighborhoods, such as the uh, Moncrief area, College Gardens area, as well as the uh, Long Branch area, and view uh, different characteristics about those neighborhoods. So right off the bat, you're able to see the uh, composite scores in the top right are actually uh, very similar to each other. Uh, but the composite breakdowns in the bottom right actually tell a little bit of a different story. Long Branch in particular has a uh, lower prevalence of stroke, while the Moncrief area has a uh, higher prevalence of diabetes compared to the other factors such as heart disease and stroke. So after we get a, um, an idea of uh, which neighborhood we want to target, we switch over to the composite dashboard to get a little bit more information about that particular neighborhood. So after the uh, neighborhood is selected, we can see the, in the uh, indicators at the top right uh, different characteristics uh, for that particular neighborhood. Uh, additionally, we also have some uh, demographic information as well as a uh, table of uh, community resource centers that the uh, Mayo Clinic is actually able to work with and implement their programs. Now, probably the most notable feature is the actual the uh, Google Street Map view in the bottom left, and that's just there to kind of tie everything together and uh, give a picture, an idea of what this uh, data set is actually representing. Now, while today mostly uh, the demo focused on Mayo's needs, I did want to take the time to mention that everything is available online, and the shade maps can actually be changed uh, to show measures like uh, stroke or diabetes or obesity across the city of Jacksonville. So other organizations can use these exact uh, same dashboards and uh, process to identify um, different neighborhoods for their own needs. And uh, that's about it for the dashboard, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn things back over to uh, Evan to discuss what's next. Thank you. Yeah, so as you can imagine, when we first saw that, we are all pretty blown away. It's pretty awesome. You can like pick a census track and then walk around it virtually. Very convenient for us that don't want to leave the AC. Um, <laughs> so where to next? Uh, so as Jason mentioned, the data is available. Uh, these dashboards are available to everybody. Uh, but go back to Wellness RX, community drive, community change. Our goal of this project was to help uh, Mayo Clinic and, and future people around Jacksonville uh, decide where to go next. So uh, we would like to alter the slogan for our needs a little bit. So finding your community and driving your change. That's our goal, and uh, we believe we accomplished it with this project. So thank you. We are now moving down to the uh, next stage uh, in our presentation. Uh, I would like now our three clients to come up to the stage for, for them to reflect. Lauren, Anne Marie, and Catherine, please come to the stage. Do you guys need a chair or can stand for 10 minutes? Okay, so. So they're essentially going to reflect on three questions. First one is, what is the biggest reveal for them up from this project? And second question is, what's the major impact of the brick reveal for the organization? And the third question is, with this FOIA data for so, uh, social science uh, program, we came up with the process, we came up with the data-driven approach of solving the problem. How are they going to continue forward with that approach within their organization? Right. Uh, we start with Lauren answering those three questions, then Catherine and Anne-Marie. Great. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here tonight. So <clears throat> I work as the Homeless Management Information System Administrator. So as you can imagine, I see the data and I work with the data nearly every day that I'm at work. So for me, seeing the work that the students did wasn't necessarily that it gave me a big reveal. 
really for me what it did was highlight the work that we still have yet to do uh, and the importance that our emergency shelter system serves in the overall homeless system and how really getting to their needs and understanding the individuals that are coming into shelter and being able to identify the best resource for them as soon as possible gives us the opportunity to intervene and hopefully end that crisis situation for them much quicker than we would normally anticipate. Second question. Sorry. Second question is, uh, <laughs> I got the, lost in my thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, impact of the finding. Uh, the impact of the finding was while we work with our community partners to really collect as much information as we can, um, as quickly and as soon as possible, we know that we have a lot of programs and a lot of um, shelters that aren't currently on the system, which makes it difficult for us to really grasp and wrap our hands around the total problem. So one of the biggest impacts for me will be taking this information back to our partners to really work with them on identifying what are the additional questions that we can ask. What's a way that we can work with you to ensure that we can get the information into the system and that we can really work to pull and identify the individuals who are frequenting all the shelters in a given month to really work with them and get them assessed and connected to permanent housing as quickly as possible. So our next steps in doing that will be really looking at some of the questions that the team identified as those kind of dignity index questions and working them in a way that isn't going to be overburdening on staff in their existing positions, because it is a lot when you're working with clients and they are coming in to shelter um, and their immediate crisis right now is where are they gonna sleep that night? It's hard for them to really conceptualize and look beyond that. But this assessment and doing this triage will allow us to really, as professionals, to really start targeting and flowing people to the appropriate resources as soon as we can. So my name is Catherine Thomas, and I am the um, founder of Yoga for Change. We've been around for three years. Um, so I think the interns found me hysterical because every time I went for like a review of the data, I was like, oh my gosh, it works. Whoa. So that was what so was great for me is because um, me and my teachers, many of them are here. We just started this because we knew it worked. And because of the nonprofit center support on me, um, and of our organization, they said, you got to collect data. So we started collecting data, and we kind of made it up as we went along. And then we, with a partnership with Magnolia Project and with Gateway, we were started to correct uh, blood pressure and heart rate. And I heard this slide when it did the cool illustration thing. Um, we see that with our classes and we see the impact we have on our students and we give them hope that it's gonna be okay. So that's the initial take I took um, from the data. And the impact it has on the organization is it's really hard to, for me at least, to get donors to donate to yoga in prison. Like, what? Okay, so, <laughs> like, how did that go? Um, but this allows us to show it works and that we're creating a decrease in stress and an increase in mood, and we're helping them with hypertension. So overall, we're really having a direct impact on communities that need it the most. Um, so this is gonna be a huge for next steps. That was the three questions, right? Okay, good. <laughs> for next steps is we're gonna take this information and make drastic change in the way that we approach donors, but more importantly, we have the data to back us up when we expand into other locations and across the state and the country, um, because we have the factual data that says it works. And it's not just Catherine Thomas saying, or Elizabeth Henrich is saying, or Chelsea Belfer saying, it's the data. And it's a lot better coming from somebody who has no skin in the game saying it works. And so I wanna thank UNF, seriously, because you've, blown my mind <laughs> and I'm so proud of what we've all created so thank you 
So I'm just going to say yoga and my stuff. We need to talk. Um, so my name is Anne Marie Knight. I'm the administrator for community relations at Mayo Clinic. And in the discussion earlier, you heard, a, you heard a little bit about the community health needs assessment. And so this document that gets shared with the community to help improve the health of the community is a base for most of our work around community relations. But it's very high level. There's county data, there's health zone data, and as our colleagues heard in our wicked problem, we wanted to get to the root, if we could. So the biggest impact um, that I see coming out of this data is the opportunity to use it for our future good, but as, as well for the community to, to take advantage of the information. So when we look at all this data, maybe your resources are limited in your outreach, and you would want to maybe have a little bit more of a narrow impact, you can see where you can focus. And when we think about communities, and we talk about the village, we always talk about the village getting the support. You know, we need the village. Well, now we can identify many villages within our city. So I think the big impact, where's my team? The big impact is that you've created a tool that we can share across the community, and I thank you for that. Second question was, What's, the, what's next? Are you going to continue forward? Okay, so it's easy what's going, what's going to happen forward. We are going to peel back that data. What you saw was only a glimpse and a quick high level. Um, at Mayo, we're going to do a deep dive to see, you know, where are our best opportunities to contribute to change in the future, and we hope that's what actually our community leaders will do as well. I just want to do a quick shout out to the health department um, because they were a key partner in this effort as well. Uh, the the data is not owned by any one organization. It is a community-wide data, and the health department was integral to making sure we could uh, put this uh, information together. So, thank, thank you. you. So stay on the stage. Okay. So. so now we are ready for a Q&A. So I would like to uh, uh, invite back our interns back to the stage to take in uh, any question and answer, I'm going to let Dan lead that. Did you want to take this? Yeah, to the floor. Good. So if anyone who's interested in asking question, please rise here and, and Mike will come next to you. So speak, speak to the mic so yes. that it's okay. recorded. I believe it was on the first slide, under the dignity, tricked into something. What does that mean? So the question on the VI Spadat is whether they've been tricked or coerced to do anything that they didn't want to do? No, that's just the question. It's, that's just how it's phrased. Hi, I have a question for the Yoga for Change. On the slide showing the changes in blood pressure, mood, and stress, did you perform tests of statistical significance on that? So uh, which, which slide were you referring? Like all of the? The before or after comparisons. Yeah, like all the stress and mood data? Yeah, yes. so your, your mm -hmm. aggregate data. Right, yes. There was uh, significance across populations and gender for all of those outcomes. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Yeah, that's great. And I'm wondering also, do you have recommendations internally for other measures, other outcomes that you think would be meaningful to collect? Uh, Hinal had some ideas on downstream outcomes. So we were, you were suggesting at the end of the slide uh, to add a recidivism or a drug abuse or how the individual is like personally like what what they're like what they're doing or how like besides the yoga session what they do uh, day to day so I think that would help uh, defining their stress level why it's like why they're coming with the high stress and why they are uh, going with the better stress level um, more um, to that level, yeah. Yes. Um, so through this process, I got to 
learn a lot about data, so it's kind of cool. And we do want to check um, and track recidivism. We are going to be working with Jacksonville Sheriff's Office to do that. Um, also, increase in grade um, outcome in reference to children that are taking our classes versus children that are not ex taking our classes. Um, we're also interested in for uh, substance abuse following up um, and seeing what specifically they're adding into their day from our programming to ensure their sobriety um, and outcomes as well. But um, we have to figure that out first. <laughs> Another question about the uh, statistics with regard to the blood pressure uh, with yoga. It, you had there 10 sessions and there seems to be improvement linearly across the whole thing except sessions seven and eight where it seemed to regress and then go back. This was in both measures. Did you find any reason for that? So when we got to uh, those sessions, um, we had fewer individuals who took uh, those sessions. So, you know, we had Jim who had, he took 21 sessions. Uh, so we could have extended those uh, mood and stress change levels out from one session to 21 sessions, but from maybe session 10 to 21, it would have just been Jim's data. Um, so we ended up aggregating uh, session 10 and 10 and more. Uh, so we believe that um, the spikes had to do with um, just a few outliers um, in those two sessions, uh, but we didn't want to remove them because, you know, obviously it still tells an important story. Can I jump in for just a second? So we only, that was only a section of the data from that time frame. Um, we have a lot of no cards coming in um, every day, and so we only had a section of that studied data from a time period. So I just want to say we do have a retention rate, um, but again, that was part of our wicked problem. So another yoga for change question. Um, so was the mood and was mood and something else. Yeah, stress. Was, was, did you use an objective tool to measure that or was that self-reporting? That's the first question. So it was self-reported, yes. Okay. So uh, before the class, they fill out the, uh, the card and after the class, they fill out the other portion of the card, yeah. And my second question was for the f people that saw an, um, a decrease in hypertension, was were those changes over time, or is it just after, after immediately after a session? I guess I'm asking: Is do you know whether those effects are lasting? I, they're after one session, and they're also um, there's a decrease after one session, and there's also a decrease longevity. I'm looking to them because I I think that, but I don't know if yeah. that's true. So the, the specific measures were taken, the blood pressure cuff and the measurements taken were done immediately before the session and immediately after the session. We have no data right now over, um, like in the middle of the day, uh, in the morning time, do we see changes in their blood pressure? We'd have to get access to that data. We don't have it right at this point. That makes sense. Yeah, so the, the measurements were collected before and after the sessions only at this point, but we're looking to those downstream uh, outcomes in the future. Okay, this has uh, to do with the yoga f for change. Um, it's being considered, well, that's because um, that's the one programmatic theme that we can follow. Um, from what you've talked about. I mean, it, the data is incredible. Uh, for those of you that don't know, there's a, an initiative that Humana has started uh, that is called the Bold Gold, and two of the primary focuses are on mental health and diabetes. With regard to mental health, we've been talking specifically about using yoga for change. My question is, when you think programmatically about how to reach the largest populations, it's not always about getting people in groups. It's about getting people to adapt their behavior longitudinally. And so my question is, as you think about program 
expansion and outreach, how are you looking at ways in which people can connect from their own homes since transportation and access can be very difficult for people to get to group activity? So just a comment. Do okay. Um, so we are very interested in um, the bold goal, and we have spoken about that application through Mindful Moments um, to potentially implement our programming there. Um, I do know a former student of mine is here right now, and he says he's been able to be sober because of implementing meditation and yoga into his everyday life. Um, so we have that person and that's you know physical data but we also do understand the uh, issues about obtaining classes etc so that's something we're really interested in and if there's anybody here who wants to fund that you know we'll be open <laughs> to that too I'd like to ask a question to the students and I'd like people who worked on Mayo and um, homelessness to answer first. I want you to think back to the start of the summer, like April, to now. What surprises you the most about you? And what surprises you the most about the world? And how might your career trajectory change? Uh, I'm the one with the microphone, so I'll kick <laughs> off. <laughs> Um, yeah, I didn't know I had the, the mental capacity to handle um, this large of a project, so that was pretty cool. Um, you can get all the degrees in the world, but until you work with something in the real world, you, you don't really know what you're capable of. So that was uh, enlightening. Um, and I definitely want to work with data in the future. Um, I think it's, uh, it drives everything. I think we kind of joke around about it. You see data everywhere now. Um, so it's a little bit of a problem for some of us sometimes. <laughs> Uh, but it, it gives you a way to answer questions, and that's uh, what I've taken away from it. So it definitely is going to drive what I do in the future. Yeah, I definitely agree with Evan in the fact that I think this project is genius due to the collaborative approach of putting data with a real-world problem. I think a lot of the times there's so much literature and journal articles and such and such, and we read it and we believe it because there's data behind it, but this is something on the ground floor within nonprofits, something like immediate issues that need fixing that sometimes are ignored. So. Within my future, I mean, I want to be a psychologist. I want to help people. This is exactly what I want to do. So, yeah. Yeah, same here. Uh, working with the data of solving the wicked problem, that's, that's the most important thing for this project. Um, she know that uh, sh uh, the stress level is decreasing in students and the mood is getting better, but uh, to prove it, we need to show the data and the results. So I think that's, that's doing that whole, uh, going through the process of analysis and then showing the result, that's what, that was the main thing for um, this project and internship program. Yep. So uh, everything has just been a little bit overwhelming as far as uh, the projects and everything at first, but actually taking this um, uh, multidisciplinary approach, working with the, the other interns that honestly, I would have never really talked to any other psychology majors or anything <laughs> like that. Um, but working with them and uh, seeing how they uh, handle everything, um, it, it, it really, uh, <laughs> Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with uh, feelings and everything. I just love the opportunity to be able to work with these people and actually uh, tackle problems as um, important to the community as homelessness and uh, overall health as well. So that's pretty much it for me. Uh, as far as uh, career aspects later on down the line, I've always wanted to uh, be a part of the community and give back, and now I've found the perfect way for me to do it by uh, actually uh, developing tools and working with data and uh, helping uh, drive change at the uh, decision level. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to the future. Oh, no, 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 I'm a nerd, I'm a computer science major. <laughs> uh, so Dan has a saying, we use a trustee of social, social, 
a social trustee of knowledge, right? So he thinks that um, being that we're educated in a public university, we have an obligation to give back some of our knowledge to the community. Um, and this project, along with some stuff that I did in his classes, uh, really uh, kind of elucidated that fact. And then also, I want to give a shout out to the Sherpas, uh, Jay and Kellen over there. When they would come and meet with us and we would show them our data, I mean, they just had fantastic ideas and it was uh, pretty amazing to see uh, just how good they are with these programs and visualizing data. And so it makes me want to get to that level, so. So we're running out of time, but we got still four more questions. So I'm gonna pass mic to you. Hi, I'm Dr. Rogers Kane, and um, uh, I work in the neighborhood. I'm on the front lines of where you guys are at. And the biggest question I have this evening is, when can we as a community of involved individuals have access to this data so that if it can help us make some decision um, that we can and any level of involvement with those other individuals that are on the ground uh, the service in the community every day day in and day out yeah so I, I think um the whole goal of this project was to do just that uh, was to allow data to be usable um, data can be really sterile um, and uh, I think what all of our projects have uh, accomplished is being able to allow people that are on the front lines like yourself to uh, use that data and um, to use it without having to read 50 empirical articles to do so. Uh, we kind of took the brunt of learning how to use all these programs <laughs> uh, so no one else really has to. Uh, so that's, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, there. Yeah, it's available. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we do have a, a link for the dashboard for Mayo Clinic. Um, it's going to be available to everybody in Jacksonville. So uh, it's a public dashboard. You can go on and play with it uh, as much as you want. <laughs> It'll be uh, linked to the DSS website. Yeah, we'll have a, um, a link that we will share uh, out with everyone that you can access the dashboard. Uh, it's online right now. Uh, if you're a Tableau user and you want to go to uh, public.tableau.com, you can find us there. But we'll, we'll share a link so that you can find it. Um, we, we should also say that um, we were very um, aware that some of the data that we were using um, dealt with people in very vulnerable positions. And so uh, we started as we started drilling down to further and further neighborhoods, you know, when we say, okay, we have a certain percentage of diabetes uh, within this neighborhood, certain prevalence. We didn't want to know who had diabetes. Um, we were okay with just saying, we know it's someone in this neighborhood, right? So people's health information is very private to them. So we, we started having those questions about how granular could we get in terms of identifying these uh, health needs. And so we were comfortable with having that kind of uh, neighborhood level, block group level information, as opposed to specific individuals, specific addresses of uh, people who had diabetes. And so we dealt with those issues with um, the Mayo Clinic Changing Homelessness and Yoga for Change, uh, some of this information is private information where it's collected from individuals about their health, about their physical well-being, and they want that information to be held private. And so any data that we have that we can aggregate and um, share publicly will do that, but then there's some data that's protected because it's about individuals, it's about people. That's right, that's right, yes, yes. And so we are making that available. So anyone in Jacksonville can use it. So first of all, um, I just want to thank you guys for doing this project. This was amazing to watch. Um, and thank you three for just doing what you do with your programs and your initiatives. But my question was, you, um, you three kind of answered what you want to see done next in your own programs. But what do you all want to see? You know, you've created this like amazing set of data, what do you want to see done with it? Um, and you might not have the answer, but if you do. Um, I kind of just want to see uh, what's next, what everybody else uh, does with this data. That's really uh, my focus. Uh, yeah, I think um, what I'd like to see, and I think Mayo would really like to see this, is uh, 
being able to uh, put resources where they're needed, um, it, also, it saves a ton of money in the end of the day, um, but more importantly, it saves people. And um, that's the goal of this project, is to put the resources where they're needed. Um, so that's where I'd like to see you know, it go. We'll go back this way. Um, so I guess with the Yoga for Change project, uh, I would like to see it expanded. Um, the Bold Goals initiative that she mentioned, I think that that would be uh, a wonderful opportunity for an organization like that. Yeah, same with the uh, Yoga for Change. Uh, adding this new uh, res uh, outcomes uh, would really help and see the individual like uh, for the future, like all the individuals that have been improved and she know them like by the students. So like that's that's going to be a major improvement in the, uh, as a whole as organization and also her goal is to create a safer community so that's that's the main goal to get there um. so i think it's really special when you find passionate people and lauren is very passionate all three of them are very passionate <laughs> i worked the most with lauren <laughs> Um, so specifically, uh, changing homelessness has decreased the veteran population of homelessness by 53%. So it's, in, it's amazing. <clears throat> so I think the fact that we were able to find things that the HMIS might have missed in order to continually drop these numbers down is what I want to see. Like Lauren, we want to get rid of homelessness. So. so um Thanks again, they were all great. This is for the, the data folks who worked on the yoga project. Was there any concern that maybe individuals showed up who had hurried to the class or run over there or been under stress before they arrived and that caused a higher blood pressure to start? And I have a second after that. So yeah, uh, with this, uh, the <laughs> stress, with this uh, self-reported stress and mood level, we did have a, a feel statement. So like what they feel at the time they came in and uh, what they feel at the time after they left. So some of the uh, notes were also like that, that I had to come here, it was like mandatory, or sometimes it's like uh, I feel really great, uh, more positive comments, but yeah, we do see uh, some uh, discrepancy in the like, how they come in and then when they leave, how differentiate uh, the, their mood and stress level. And the, and the second one, I know a fair chunk of those individuals were incarcerated, I believe. And so this is an opportunity to not sit in a cell. Might that have resulted in them saying, I'm gonna score this high just so I can get out of the cell? Right, well, uh, I wanna go back to your first question, actually. Uh, so with the blood pressure data, uh, Catherine and Yoga for Change, they focus on vulnerable populations. Uh, so these are p people who may, in their just daily lives, they are under a lot of stress. Uh, so I don't know um, the blood pressure data. I think the important thing is the change, the fact that they went from uh, these hypertension stage two or stage one down to ideal. Um, and then what was your second question? I'm sorry, you were saying incarcerated individuals? I mean, I'm not entirely sure about the process, but I don't think that you did, the Yoga for Change says if you don't score well on this, you won't come back. Kick them out. No, no, no. Um, so just like super quick, because I know we have some time, but it's all voluntary initially, um, but the Duval County Court System actually found out about our program, and now they're sentencing individuals to our program because of the decrease in stress and increase in mood and the hypertension. So a lot of people do come in like, oh, I don't want to be here. It's yoga. Guys, normally. But then they feel better at the end of an hour. So initially, they might not want to be there, but they feel better. And as I am aware that um, they are in jail, and many of them do have the misconception that they're going to come, and it's going to be a female yoga teacher wearing yoga clothes, um, but our teachers don't show up that way. We have a uniform, which is appropriate, and we are just a sort of figure showing them a yoga practice, and we get through that misconception pretty quickly by the type of yoga we teach and the way that we speak to individuals who are, 
uh, either sentenced or voluntary at our class. I know still many people want to ask questions. So we're going to have one last question, and after that we will opening for network reception so those who have questions can ask directly to the students or the client to those questions. So Carl will ask the last questions for the day. Um, thank you all for doing this. Um, this is for Rachel and for Lauren. Um, what made you think about in the changing homelessness study um, looking at the variables uh, concerning dignity? Because the other variables seem pretty you know, reasonable and a lot of people use those, the vulnerability index, the health questions, things like that. But when you started breaking it down into the dignity, what can you kind of give us an idea of what your mindset was or what you saw that made you think about bringing out those variables in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So this was a collaborative effort, um, and I will give credit to Dr. Richard and Dr. Romopathy. Um, so we were sitting in a conference room trying to figure out what else is going on. Um, you know, we read so many research articles that say there are so many certain specific reasons for why people are homeless, and some, this is something that is very nuanced, very novel, and we think it's very important. And then also with our collaboration with Lauren, uh, she believes that this is something that again is very important, and that's something that the HMIS needs to have introduced. Yeah, and to add to that, I think um, overall, when we look at the VI SPDEX, I know Carl, we work very closely together, <clears throat> we see it in a different way. So for us, it's a different assessment tool. But when we look at the actual programs and individuals that are coming into any of our shelters, what are those core things that they're looking for? Um, we joked about it at one point during one of our meetings that it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So when you're really at that bottom level, what does it take to sort of reach those higher levels? So when we started working and the students really started pulling apart some of that data that they received, all aggregate, so all personal information was stripped out of it, they really took to the data and looked at where were individuals scoring the highest in those assessments, and then that sort of informed the index scale that they created their profiles off of. Yeah, and then just one other quick thought regarding that, regarding Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think it's also a very common misconception for people to believe that if you're homeless, you should be looking for a job, that kind of thing. But in actuality, this dignity index really nails down the fact that it is extremely difficult to get a job without an address. So. Uh, thank you, everyone. So let's give a big applause to all of our three clients. <laughs> so when we are piloting something, we ourselves need courage. And for that, having a three good go-getter kind of clients was very key important thing for us, and we were very lucky to get them. And after that, getting the most talented students are the key important component of it. And we were also, again, lucky in getting uh, the top five skills that are there at UNF. So please give them a big hand, <laughs> too. Uh, thank you. You guys can take rest now. <laughs> so we will uh, quickly go on to the next stage of it. S so we are at the last edge of this. We are now ready to wrap things up. So we do want to continue doing this. We do try to plan, and we are planning for the 2018 Florida Data Science for Social Good. So we will be looking for people to fund us for the uh, next cycle of the things, and we hopefully will be working on in the upcoming months. So if you are a potential client and you are going to willing to participate with us for the next upcoming summer, what should you should we start thinking now is what this slide is talking about. So we would want you to start thinking about what would be your wicked problem, whether or not you can get an organization-wide commitment to work on that wicked problem, and where would be those data will be coming from. Right? Whether it's public data or the private data, if it is private data, you need to start collecting it. How are you going to go about it? What is going to be it? And you need to start collecting them. Right? So we will be making call for proposals in early January. So by then, you need to be ready with a wicked problem, data set, 
and commitment from your leadership uh, need to be there. So, and we will again follow the same approach. Uh, we will, uh, and you can see the takeaway where the timeline is there, description is there, website is there, project description of for this three years is there. So take the takeaway with you uh, if you are planning to participate with us for the next year, right? So uh, with that, everyone, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming, coming and joining us. So, Again, thank you very much for our clients, and we are very glad to our, our interns, and we hope to continue working with them on our other forms. Dan, Rina, please come and join us. And, uh, and thank you very much for Rina for supporting us and taking her leap and faith with us and getting this started. With this, I will give her the last word to her. She gets the last word. <laughs> uh, he, yeah, I, I, I was gonna make exactly the pitch Karthik did, so I don't need to, this is awesome. But I wanna go back to, someone asked a question in the back, what, what's the, what, did, what will you do with this? What was the difference? What, what, what do you um, see as the change here? And for the nonprofit center, because our work is all about connecting, strengthening, and advocating for what I believe is absolutely the most important um, part of our community in keeping us safe, strong, healthy, and, um, and well in every sense of the word. Um, the nonprofit sector has so much to catch up with in data. And why? Because it is expensive. It is hard to do. So the way for us at the Nonprofit Center to tackle this problem is to partner with the smart people who have great data solvers. So I, I cannot tell you how impressed, I wrote cool like seven times on my paper. Um, I'm so impressed. I'm just overjoyed with the results. I think there's big things that are coming out of these three projects and think how much more we can do with other projects. And I don't think we've thanked Karthik and Dan yet because the amount of work they put in is amazing. So there's, besides the very cool big reveal papers, there's our little paper here. And it says, learn more about the Florida DSSG program. And if you think you know someone who would be interested in supporting this program, because it's got to keep going. It's, I mean, it has to keep going. Please call me, or Karthik, or Dan. We're really building support for it. And um, we are anxious to get it nailed down before the end of this year. Um, with that, there is wine, beer, Coke, soda, and little cheese cubes over there. So please help yourself and uh, congratulate the students and thank Dan and uh, Karthik when you have a chance. And um, thank you all for coming. So, See so you next sorry. year. I guess I have to steal the last word, sorry. Uh, we want also want to thank our advisors and industry uh, partners, without whom we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have a good discussion. Bogdan, or Ari, Karen, Jay, please stand up. So, and we want to thank you guys for what you guys did. And in next few days, we will be sending an email and asking for feedback. So please, free, uh, please find time to respond to us. And with that, thank you, everyone. And we'll be hanging around here. Feel free to ask whatever question you guys have for us. Thank you. <laughs>